Hi, I'm Jerry Mikulski. This is a five-minute university about artificial intelligence and machine learning. A look backward and a little look forward. Back it's since the earliest computers in the mid-40s, people were trying to figure out how to model human thinking. It seems only reasonable. To grossly oversimplify and tell the story, this followed two paths. Some researchers tried to emulate the logic of reasoning. So if you have sniffles and a cough, then maybe you have the flu, except when you have the chills, maybe it's malaria, you can see how this gets pretty complicated. Another bunch of researchers tried to emulate the biology, the neurochemistry of, of learning and reasoning, and they tried to map how neurons work, where they have inputs, they have some kind of threshold function, they then send, they then trigger or don't trigger, firing an input to some other neuron, et, et cetera, but in, in these webs that turn into a lot of matrix math. The first group were known as expert systems developers, and the second group became known as neural networks or artificial neural networks. The expert systems were interesting because you would sit a knowledge engineer down with a domain expert. They would craft a series of explicit rules, like if you have a chill. Um, this left a nice audit trail when the expert system made a recommendation because uh, you could then figure out which rules had been triggered. Neural networks learn from large data sets. You feed them inputs and outputs, and then you say, well, with this input, what would the output look like? They're very calculation intensive and occasionally gave amazing results, but they couldn't really leave an audit trail. It's not impossible to figure out what a neural network did, but it's incredibly uh, difficult compared to expert systems. Now, in 1969, two bigwigs in the field, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, wrote a book titled Perceptrons. Perceptrons nixed research in neural networks for a good 10 to 15 years because they proved that neural networks were impossible. And what they proved actually was that mathematically, very thin neural networks didn't have the mathematical complexity to model things. That was true, but what they were saying was that this field of study was wrong, and they were entirely wrong. What happens is, uh, a little bit later, expert systems get better and start to find mainstream use, but all of a sudden, neural networks, because of a few people still working in the field, um, found they, they could start to architect hidden layers, multiple layers into their systems, and this became known as something called deep learning, depth being the, the, the interesting word here. They got, uh, they got some boost because instead of just using uh, computer CPUs, they got to use graphic processors, GPUs, and that added a lot of speed, and they got breakthrough performance in some narrow domains. So if you really applied this intelligence to something specific, it got really good. Out of this, we got some variants of neural nets called convolutional neural nets, recurrent neural nets, and a series of others. Um, because I bear a little bit of a grudge against the expert systems folks, I tend to think of artificial intelligence as the expert system stuff, the rules-based stuff, machine intelligence as the broad category, and, and machine learning as the category for neural networks. Although it could be that machine learning is all the broad category that encompasses everybody, but that makes it a little harder to discriminate. This is me in the late 80s at New Science Associates, where I was a research analyst uh, about to uh, go give a presentation. Those are acetates that I, I have my presentation printed on. And this is a report I wrote in uh, 1988 titled Neural Networks Prospects for Commercial Use. I have a little bit of history in this field, and I loved discovering uh, neural networks and writing about them back in the day. So what happens then? Expert systems got better too, but not as much. Machine learning started to take off because we started to get gigantic data sets. Um, GPUs gave way to TPUs, tensor processing units, and other special purpose hardware that could do the matrix math and other things much better. And we got breakthrough performance in much broader domains. You've seen it some yourself with GPT-4 and uh, stable diffusion and a series of other things. And here the models are called generative adversarial networks, large language models, transformers. GPT is the generative pre-trained transformer. Um, uh, and latent diffusion models like stable diffusion for artwork. This is a thrilling sort of era. And what I think is happening right now, now your mileage may vary on these conclusions, but I think A, this is real. This, this moment for uh, neural networks and machine learning is extremely real. These things are very powerful, they're very helpful. They're easy to misuse, but when used properly, they're fantastic. Machine learning eats tasks not jobs, meaning everybody's worried about the replacement of a complete job. It's really hard to do somebody's entire job. It's pretty easy to peel off different tasks. Three of your six tasks that are important to do get eaten by some sort of technology. We're going to have to redesign your job or let you go or have fewer of you or something like that. So it's really important whether we approach these technologies with the intention of augmenting humans 
or replacing them? This is a big philosophical question. Unfortunately, capitalism pushes us really hard to replace. Corporations have been trying to get rid of full-time employees for years and years and years and doing a very good job of it. Um, but this is a, a really important philosophical question. But I think our future is cyborg. I think human in the loop really matters. And by our future is cyborg, I mean a blending of human and, and machine. And I don't mean through prosthetics or some kind of man-machine interface, at least not at this point. I just mean through software that you can consider an extension of your capabilities, a superpower added. Then if you have a sort of a special touch for spreadsheets or Photoshop or some other piece of software where you really are no longer thinking about the software or Procreate, and all of a sudden things come out of you that are that are expressions of what you're thinking, you're already well down the path of being a cyborg. Now this cyborg thing uh, around all the tools that I just described have a growing flourishing ecosystem. There are all kinds of interesting variants and power tools and enhancements showing up. Um, but we're not getting to sort of general purpose smart intelligence like humans. Instead, um, not being this not being like a human is really not a barrier. There's plenty we can do. Um, the system is self-improving now in the sense that we can give these systems uh, all sorts of prompts and, and help to start solving the gaps and the problems that are showing up in the system. Fusion across these systems will happen. Part of the problem is that you don't want to give a neural network your accounting, your bookkeeping. Neural networks are not precise. They're just a map of neurons that seems to understand its inputs. You want something that will actually always give you four for two plus two. Um, but when you start to fuse, when you start to fact check the results given to you uh, by machine learning, then you could get to some interesting places. When you start to connect a series of these things together, you start to get higher level reasoning that in many cases could make far better decisions than humans can. That's interesting territory. So. We're heading down the road either toward a utopia or a dystopia, depending on how we implement these technologies. That They're that powerful. Whether we end up uh, in the U or the D really depends on the choices that we make today, the choices that you make today. Thanks for listening. This is one of several five-minute universities. I encourage you to uh, make one too. But in the meantime, be a good cyborg.